Uh, I must say that this is a very exciting crowd. Uh, so to Steve's point, up until the end of last year, we used to run these uh, user conferences, three events, one in the US, one in um, Europe, and one in APAC. And we would get roughly around 1,000 to uh, 1,500 attendees. Uh, and then we decided, you know what, let's use that budget in a more effective way and, and do these summits. So we have 21 summits scheduled for this year. Uh, and this by far, I think I, we just did a quick count. This is by far the, the biggest attendance we have uh, for the summits that we've had this year. So round of applause to all of you <laughs> for making that, uh, making that commitment. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be here. Uh, and let's get started. All right. First of all, thank you, Steve, for putting that beautiful picture of me on the slide. I look like Gollum. Um, <laughs> it's the ears, you know. I can't help it. All right. Um, a quick introduction to WSO2. Some of you, uh, before I get here, if I could get a quick show of hands, how many of you are using WS2 today, in either in production or in a development setting? Show of hands, please. All right. And how many of you actually have a subscription with either Deox or any of the service providers or with WS2 for all of that? Let's see a show of hands who don't have. That's probably the best way to do it. You are using WS2, but you don't have. So, All right, account managers, take a note, chase after them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. So WS2, we started in 2005. So we are 14 years old. We are coming up on 14 years. I actually joined the company in 2006. So I was the first sales hire. Um, I'm still technically in my first sales role. I used to be an engineer. The CEO, um, founder Sanjeev Veerwarna, for some reason said, why don't you give sales a shot? I was like, okay. Never done sales in my life, but he said, give it a, sh uh, a shot at sales, and, and I'm still with the company, and today I head the global operations for, for WSO2. Um, 14 years old, um, we have roughly about 600 employees. Globally, we have seven physical offices in Sri Lanka, in the UK, in Germany, uh, in Brazil, North America, and in Sydney, uh, in Australia. Um, we are committed to open source. You will get to hear more about open source, and of course, we have a separate session this afternoon as well, talking about open source, why we are actually committed towards open source, and, and why we still believe open source is the right way forward. Um, we were initially funded by Intel Capital. Uh, right now, we are uh, invested by Toba Capital and, and Cisco as well. Um, and we are growing at a fairly good clip. We are growing at 50% year on year. We generated $37 million in subscription revenue. Total revenue rough, last year was roughly around 50 million, and we expect to grow at 50% year on year this year as well. We have 500 plus subscription customers. Of course, we have times 10, 20 that are using WSO2 without a subscription, but that's perfectly fine, and we support that as well. But, but we are growing that base uh, quite aggressively as well uh, throughout these years. Another case in point, you probably know this already. If you don't, uh, it's an important point. Is that last year, Gartner positioned WS2 as the world's largest open source integration company. This is from a revenue standpoint. So uh, the runner-up, believe it or not, is Red Hat. Um, so we own about 37% of the market share. Uh, if you take the total middleware space, which is about a $34 billion market, you have the whales like Oracle, IBM, and all these guys in there's a small sliver that's pure open source. And if you take that open source market, we own 37% of that market share. Uh, and then second in line is Red Hat with about 30%. So what I'm trying to say here is that if in your evaluations, your technology selection, if, if open source is a key criteria, you sh certainly should be looking at WSO2. I'm not saying we are the right choice, but we should definitely be on that list of vendors that you want to evaluate if open source in, is in fact one of your key uh, criteria for selection. Um, it's not just from a revenue standpoint, from even from a product functionality capability standpoint, we are one of the leaders. So Frost uh, Q4 of last year gave this position for us, which we are quite proud of. We are one of the four uh, leading API management vendors in the world today. Uh, so we are being partnered up with Google by way of Apigee, Software AG. God knows why Software AG is there, but they're there. And, and IBM. Right, so uh, this is a huge accomplishment for WSO2, and, and for me personally, if you keep WSO2 aside, this also uh, proves the point that a pure open source technology company can be a leader, right, in this space. And who would have thought that that would happen 10, 15 years ago? So it's a huge achievement. We are very proud of this, and we will continue to be the leader. That's our objective in when it comes to API management. Um, you probably know this already, we are a platform company, we are not just about API management, we have all 
kinds of other capabilities as well that supports a digital uh, transformation organization. Uh, identity access management is another key uh, product that we offer and Kapinga Coal positioned us as one of the leading vendors in that space as well. Of course, we are not the only open source vendor there. As you can see, Forge Rock is there as well. But if you were to uh, look for a open source company that provides a complete platform, again, WS2 is the only company that, that sticks in, uh, stands out in this report. Um, and this is another thing that we do. So, so when it comes to open source, we try and you know, practice the open source paradigm all the way through to how we operate our company as well. So for a private company, you rarely put your financials out. So, so these are published numbers. So at the end of each year, we publish our numbers openly. We have no issues with that. And um, as you can see, like I said, we are growing at a very good pace, 50% year on year. Just to give you a, a sense of reference here, uh, MuleSoft, when they went public, they were growing at 51, 52% year on year subscription. And they have a, even though they call themselves open source, they in fact have the dual licensing model, right? So you have your children's edition, which is open source. You don't get all the capabilities, but if you want the enterprise version of it, that for that you actually need to pay a license fee. So they were growing at about 51, 52% just before they went public. So WSO2 with a very permissive licensing model, right? There were a couple of show of hands here where you are actually using WS2 with zero contracts, uh, subscription contracts with WSO2. Uh, but even with that, we are able to grow at a good pace of 50%. So it's not just the technology capability, but we also have been able to prove that you can run a sustainable business on a pure open source business model. Another good thing, which is uh, something that uh, subscription-based companies uh, yearn for pretty much is the dollar-based net retention rate. What this means is that our existing customers are continuing to buy more services, products from WSO2. So hypothetically speaking, if we were to shut down sales and marketing today, WSO2 will still grow at a small pace. For a subscription-based uh, com company, that's, that's golden. That's what everybody wants. So, so we, we are growing at a very good pace there as well. Um, and then if you look at where we are getting our customers, they're all over the place. We are across multiple verticals, financial, healthcare, government, transport, education, you name it. And we have flagship names uh, based all over the world. And some of these logos are actually here. We'll be talking uh, about what their, their experience with WS2 as well. So this really drives the point of what we are trying to talk about today, which is about APIs, is that you know, APIs today has a much bigger impact in organizations than technology. Technology is essentially an enabler to organizations to leverage the capabilities of APIs. It's so significant that today's, you know, if you take the API, uh, internet traffic, almost 25% of internet traffic is coming by way of APIs. Almost a trillion dollars worth of revenue is being redistributed within these API networks globally as well. And about 25% of the revenue, global revenue, is running through APIs as well. So it's a significant uh, increase of the usage of APIs that we are seeing. And, and why is this, right? Uh, again, this is, not, uh, this is not necessarily rocket science, but it's because of this digital transformation journey that everyone's on. It's, it's, a, it's a buzzword that came about a couple of years ago, but nowadays it's no longer an option. It's not a nice to have thing. It's almost a must have. If you're not part and parcel of some sort of a digital transformation, then as an organization, you're gonna fall behind, you're gonna be outdated, you won't have that level of relationship that you have with customers and you're gonna lose as an organization at the end of the day. And, and as a consumer, if you were to take a step back, it's an exciting time to be, uh, as a, to be a consumer. Uh, if you look at different verticals, I mean, I love telling stories, I'm a sales guy, I, I tell stories. Uh, you know, for example, in, in, in the US, um, there was this company called Metromile that just came up a couple of years ago. About three years ago, they already valued at half a billion dollars. And they came up with this unique uh, idea to address the auto insurance market. Now, the standard rule is if you have a car, you give the make model when the EA was built, and you pay a fixed fee on a monthly basis for insurance, right? But at a fundamental level, if you think about it, you really need the insurance when you actually drive in the car, right? When it's parked, you really don't need an insurance. Okay, fine, you have robberies and whatnot, but that's a small part of it. But for the most part, insurance is necessary when you actually drive in the car. If you meet with an accident, you want the insurance to cover it. So what these guys did was said, fine, we'll only charge you for the amount that you drive, right? If you drive only 10 miles a month, 
we'll charge you for those 10 miles because it's for those 10 miles that you actually need the insurance. Uh, so it's a very simple business model. They don't have physical offices. You sign up for it online. They'll send you a pulse device. So obviously they're going to start tracking your vehicle if you're okay with that. Uh, I'm, I'm a customer. They send you a pulse device. You just plug it in. And they have this platform where they will start tracking your car. And for every mile that you drive, they charge you four cents. Right? So, so I had two cars. I used to pay like $200. It's down to one car now. It's because the ex-wife wife took the other car. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, talk about that over drinks. That's a different kind of digital transformation. Um, <laughs> so so I, used to be pay, I used to be paying almost $200. Now I'm paying less than 50 bucks. Right? And the company is only three years old, worth over half a billion dollars. Right? So they're rattling the cage. Right? All these other insurance companies are like, all right, what do we do now? Right? So now they need to pick up the pace, realize that this is the new way of doing things, and get, get in with the bandwagon. So those are some of the simple examples. Another one is a company called Sophie. I'm pretty sure you have this stuff here as well. Uh, banks that are literally built out of digital, uh, they don't have physical offices. They're pure digital banks. A bank called Sophie in the US, I'm a customer there as well, been there for about eight years, they're worth more than a billion dollars. No physical offices, everything is online. You can get loans within minutes, no expenses, no rates, none of that stuff. So, so what it goes to show is that the, as a consumer, there, there are so many demands coming up from markets. Uh, from different markets and and for you to sustain to be able to compete in these markets you need to be nimble you need to be agile so you can quickly respond to these different business requirements and then be able to move forward and and the way that it really has happened is this aggregation of architectures breaking your application your monolithic application into different components right which we call endpoints you know break all this stuff down to endpoints so that you can reuse repurpose and recreate new value to your customers, to your supply chain, and so on and so forth. So as of today, there's close to about 50 billion endpoints today with expectations that it's gonna grow to over a trillion endpoints within the next few years. So there's this explosion of endpoints that's happening and APIs are really the way in which you can service these endpoints, right? Um, and, and, if, and then of course, that's where we get into this cloud native conversation, how cloud infrastructure helps you to scale and be able to support these kinds of uh, endpoints and scalability and so on. And, and at the end of the day, if you look at it at a microscopic level, all these endpoints, the way they integrate with each other is through via APIs, right? Uh, and this is what Randy Hefner, a uh, uh, garden analyst that we, we keep in touch with quite closely, has been saying, which he pretty much hit the nail on the head there, talk, saying that APIs create business agility that fosters the rapid business reconfiguration necessary to continually adapt to an unknown future. There, there was a time when organizations could predict what's going to happen in the next two to three years. Those days are gone. You simply don't know what's going to come next. There was predictability in terms of usage, capacity, and all of that stuff. That, again, is out the window. So how do we uh, you know, deal with all this stuff? And, and the heart of it is really APIs. And these are some of the customers that we've been working with for, for the past several years. Steve made a very good point in recognizing the customers who've been with us for the longest time. Uh, this is some of them. Uh, of course, there's much more. Uh, Telecom Kenya, uh, again, we are in Kenya as well. Uh, fairly large deployment there. Discover Vitality is here, where they'll be talking about CITA and Time Bank as well. There's much more involved in here. So, you know, WS2, as I said, we've been around for 14 years. In, in our experience, this, this, you know, these are the key three reasons as to why a customer would decide to go with WS2. We believe these are the three fundamentals that we feel that makes us stand out. One is that we have an integrated platform. For us from day one, both Sanju and Paul realized that integration is not a simple problem to solve. Uh, it's not a point product, cannot solve this issue. You're talking about integration, you're talking about governance, security, analytics, and so on and so forth. So, so you need to have this platform of multiple capabilities in order to address this integration issue. The second point is open source, clearly. That has always been our differentiator. You know, as, as, as the first sales guy, that was the first pitch that I would do. Saying, you know, if you use IBM Oracle, you know, we provide more or less the same capabilities, oh, by the way, but we are a 100% open source company, right? You can use the technology today without paying us a cent. So we'll talk more about open source. We have a session in the afternoon as well, talk more as to what, why this is really a, 
uh, uh, key differentiator in, 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 in you know, today's environment. And of course, talk about agile transformation methodology. This is something that's coming out of our CTO's office. Uh, you know, agile transformation is key when we are talking about predictability and be able to respond to new key markets, requirements, and so on. It's not just about being able to generate those APIs, but also be able to quickly translate that into an actual product that you can provide to your end customers, to your supply chain, and so on. So we'll be talking about that as well later on today. So coming to the platform, if you were to just dig into those three key topics, um, you know, API management is our flagship product. More than half of our customers, 500 customers, use API management. And we manage close to about 20,000 APIs today across 2,000 organizations. This number has obviously increased uh, since the uh, beginning of this year. And from that, we've been able to complement integration. You have APIs in place. What are your integration capabilities in order to support those underneath uh, integrations? Um, then, of course, you have identity and access management. These two go hand in hand as well. If you're going to be exposing APIs, both internally and externally, What's your security looking like as of today? That's, that's a key component that most people tend to forget. Um, so we manage about 60 million identities. I believe this has grown to close to about 80 million as of today. And when it comes to integ uh, integration, we do 6 trillion transactions a uh, year today. And this tends to oscillate quite significantly. Um, for example, eBay, every single transaction is running through uh, WS2 as of today. So it has its own seasonalities. If you have Black Friday here in South Africa, but it's huge in, in the US, the traffic is roughly around five to six billion a day. On a Black Friday, that goes up to about 15 to 20 billion transactions a day. So it's a significant spike in terms of a transaction that needs to be supported, and we are doing that as of today as well. Open source. So you know, at, at a very high level, open source, at the end of the day, what we provide to our customers is really an integration capability. And, and integration means Essentially, how do you get two points to talk to each other, right? So, so we feel open source provides the best platform in which you can come up with a, 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 a technology that really makes sense, that comes from the community itself. It's not a technology that's built within a small office, within a bubble, where they feel this is the right way, these are the right standards, these are the kinds of integrations that needs to happen. We've taken it from the, uh, from the field itself. Now, as I said earlier on, our, our API management product is the world's largest simply because of our customers, our users, the feedback they've given to us. Uh, the ESB is one of the leading products today. It's because of the, the, the load and the stability that we had to provide to eBay, right? eBay wouldn't have gone with the product of WS2 if we weren't able to manage that kind of scale. So, so we believe that taking community feedback is the best way to have rapid innovation in products and also build a product that makes sense, that's relevant, and applicable to today's market. And as you can see, we have been a, a thought leader around the open source space, uh, over a million uh, contribution to the open source forum, seventh largest Apache contributor. Uh, fun fact, outside of the US, the largest open source contribution in the Apache world is in fact in Sri Lanka, outside of, uh, outside of the US. And we are in the top 100 in terms of the GitHub contributorships as well. And you know, this is something that we believe was the right way to go. Open source was going to create a new market. And last year, we were, you know, the, the market responded and proved that our, our position that we took 15 years ago was in fact valid. Last year was a tremendous year for, for open source. Uh, you know, Red Hat's acquisition by IBM proved that enterprises are in fact looking at open source in a very, very real way. Uh, as I said earlier on, <coughs> We own about 37% of the market, and we were growing at double uh, digits. If you take IBM, Oracle, uh, specifically IBM, Oracle, and Tipco, they're actually losing market share in double digits, right? So IBM realized if you are to continue to expand in the market, we need to go to the next best thing, and that's open source. And Red Hat is by far the most successful open source company in the world as of today. So. GitHub was acquired by Microsoft, MuleSoft by Salesforce, so Hortonworks, Cloudera mergers. So this went to prove that open source, in fact, is a sustainable business and large real organizations, enterprises, are banking their businesses on open source as well. So it was a tremendous year, and we realized this 15 years ago, but it took 15 years for, for the likes of IBM to realize it as well. Um, so agility, as I said earlier on, at the end of the day, we provide the technology know-how 
but agility is again is is a, a model that has to be built into an organization um, and agility is not something that you can do overnight it takes time uh, you have to think of people processes as well as technology so we've had the benefit of hindsight we've been in the business for almost 15 years um, the CTO office actually collated all the information, the experiences that we've gotten from working with all types of customers of all sizes and come up with a maturity model. Uh, so this maturity model is categorized into five different uh, areas, uh, taking into account people, process technology, and so on. And, and we, use, we use this as a benchmark to help organizations who are at their early stages of figuring out how are we are going to get into this digital space to really figure out where they are as of today. And, and we do this in a very you know, high touch mode where we have consultants coming on site. We have people like Paul and our CTO office that will go on site, spend a couple of days there and talking with multiple groups of people um, and, and sort of mapping out, okay, which stage are you at in terms of maturity? And then what we do is we have also developed references architectures, which are more like cookie cutter approaches where you can start figuring out, okay, I'm here. How do I get to this next phase? And what are the architectures, different kinds of architectures that we need to have in place? Um, so those are the things that we do as part of our CTO office and R&D team. And, and we want to bring to the table not just the technology, but also the best practices as to how you can roll something like this out as well. And so if you were to look at the, all the value propositions that we bring to the table besides the products, as you can see, we have our products. We allow them to be reused, developed, reused, run, managed within our ecosystem. And then we bring our best practices in by way of methodologies, reference architectures, and then we, underneath, we have an R&D team that's continuing to evolve our product stack and, and lead the way as well. So we call this our WS3 integration agile platform because we also feel that, you know, as a vendor, our responsibility is to make sure that we know what's coming next, right? So it, it's not just about being able to address your immediate requirements, but also be able to understand what's going to come next and prepare you for that as well. Uh, the way that most of the large organizations, how they deal with that is that they just simply go and buy the company, right? If you take IBM, they see a big hype coming up, they'll see who's the leading vendor there and just simply go and buy them out, right? So although it does allow them to quickly shortcut and get to that space quickly enough, it also promotes discontinuity within that organization. If you take IBM and go and ask them for an ESB, they'll give you eight ESBs, right? You have to pick and choose which one you want. So that's because of their, you know, sees the, their experience of acquiring so many companies. What we want to do is instead of acquiring, by the way, we, have, we haven't acquired a single organization. Everything was built ground up. What we want to do is if we are seeing a trend coming up in the future, we want to have a narrative that allows us to organically grow to that next step, right? So WS2, when we first got started, you know, WS, web services. The company was based on web services. That's how we first got started. But then since then, we moved into service-oriented architecture, and now we are here. So there will be new things that will come up. But as a vendor, we want to be able to be there to support our customers to realize, okay, if this is where you want to go, this is the next big thing, but this is the exact way in which you should get there. It's not just about ripping that and putting something else in, in place. So the research team is very much involved in figuring out what that is and then guiding the product teams to go down that right path as well. Um, so agile integration, again, I will keep this at a very high level. Paul is, is the, the co-author in this space as well. Um, and and this, uh, one of the statistics that we found uh, quite surprising last year was that <coughs> it's called the agile report that gets published every year. Um, and it turns out that, you know, agile development is, is not a new thing. We've been practicing this for a very long time. It, uh, you know, roughly around 96% of all developers address certain type of agile development. But surprisingly, only 4% is really generating value out of it. It's really being able to generate real agile integration capabilities, such as being able to release on a frequent basis. So even though majority of the people are actually practicing agile integration, agile development, they're not necessarily seeing the value of it. So, so what was the real cause of it? And then this is what we discovered was that we are very much, when you come to the integration middleware landscape, it's still very much a landscape-driven layered architecture, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with this, mind you. This is the golden standard. This, is, this works as of today, and we used to be promoting this as well. We still promote it. 
where you, know, you have your individual application development teams who are quite agile, they'll develop everything, but when it comes to the integration layer, that has to go through a central team, right? It's quite common where you have a central ESB, you have a governance team that's responsible for security, monitoring, and all that stuff. So even though your application development teams are quite agile, for it to get rolled into production has to go through this layered structure, and that tends to create a bottleneck, right? Even as of today, DevOps is handled by a different team. We, WSO2, we actually have a separate team that's focused on DevOps, because we realize if the DevOps teams is not happy with WSO2, they're not going to renew their subscription, right? So, so we are sort of playing along with that trend as well. So that's what has really created this slowdown and not being able to really reap the benefits of Agile implementation. And something that we are going to come up with, again, this is something that we are building as of today, uh, that's really going to address the composable enterprise uh, paradigm, which we call a cell. Cell is essentially a, an autonomous uh, uh, element where a, a development team is able to not just build the application logic, but also be able to integrate the, Im include the integration logic as well into it, right? This is where the microservices picture comes in. Of course, microservices allows you to in embed the application logic, but in our, in our opinion, that alone is not sufficient in order to have a self-sustaining autonomous cell, right? Composable architecture. You need to have the integration logic built into it as well. So we are talking about a self-contained, something that can be deployed as a single unit that can scale up and down as and when required, and that has some sort of a control plane where you can manage what's happening within that cell as well. So if you were to look at the two, two sides of the architecture as of today, you have your la layered monolithic architecture where you have centralized change control and all that stuff that's happening as of today, which is working perfectly fine, and then you have your composable enterprise. This is where we have used the cell-based architecture which allows you to not just have the application logic, but also be able to have a, a micro gateway in there, a micro ESB, uh, security, data, and all of that stuff within that cell itself. And, and this is something that we, we present to our customers. Every time we go on site, we're trying to, uh, depending on where they are in, in terms of their journey, uh, there are some customers who are willing to take a leap of faith with us and say, okay, let's go with the cell-based architecture uh, approach, and we are more than happy to take that route as well but most, uh, most often than not, we have this layered architecture as well. Again, this goes to prove the point that we want to continue to think what's ahead, uh, ahead of us and be able to support that trend as well. So from a product portfolio standpoint, we will have these two generations of uh, families of products. We will have for the layered architecture, we will continue to invest heavily into IPI manager product. We have our enterprise integrator, identity access manager. We will continue to invest in these products and make sure that they are the number one uh, in terms of their own specific space. So our objective is to be the number one open source alternative in all of these uh, three key vectors. Of course, API manager, we are the largest irrespective of whether it's open source or not. Enterprise integrator, we are roughly around the second or the third as of today, so we have some work to do there. Identity Access Manager, again, we are the number one. So we will continue to heavily invest into this and, and support the layered architecture. There's no question about it. Cons composable architecture is something that's coming up as well with Kubernetes and all these other uh, big things. Uh, and we have started building those products that support that composable uh, nature as well with the microservices, with Ballerina, which is something that Paul and I, uh, the dev team will talk about. Uh, and of course, we have our micro ESB, by which we call the Microsoft Enterprise Integrator, micro gateway, and we are in the works of putting a micro identity and so on and so forth. So these will, in fact, work within those cells that I explained earlier on. Uh, and this is the next big thing. Again, this is part of our R&D team. goes to show that we are not just going to stick to what we have as of today. Uh, this is a new programming language that we started uh, creating about four years ago. It's a programming language that's, that's at its heart is built for integration. It's a programming language that understands endpoints. It's a programming language that understands APIs. So, so we will compete with different programming languages, but the level of productivity that we get out of this is, is ex exponential. Um, 1.0 is around the corner. Again, this is pure open source. We are treating this as a separate brand altogether. Uh, you are more than welcome to try it out, play around with it, contribute back, uh, but, but we have good, exciting, I mean, we are quite excited about this. Uh, we did a, 
uh, KubeCon, was it KubeCon, Paul, in Seattle? Was it KubeCon? I keep mixing the two up. It's KubeCon. Oh, it has to be KubeCon. KubeCon, KubeCon yes. We were at KubeCon, and, and this session was sold out within the first two days. Right? We had over 200 attendees there as well, and, and we are one of the key sponsors at all of the KubeCon events as well, promoting Ballerina as a programming language. It's getting a lot of um, spotlight, especially in, in, in the US. Commercial stuff, the boring stuff. All right, so, so you know, as I said earlier on, we are a 100% open source company. We don't have different sets of IP as such. What you download from the website, that's what goes into production. There is no secondary version or anything like that. Wh how we've monetized this is by providing you with updates, with patches. Right. If you once you put something into production, you have customer traffic running through it. You want to ensure that these systems don't go down 24/7, 365. Imagine if eBay shuts down for one minute, that won't be WSO2 tomorrow, right? So one minute for eBay, that's that'll cost them you know millions and millions of dollars. So subscription is essentially mitigating that risk. We provide that insurance, saying that if you are using WSO2 in production setup, we will provide that insurance 24/7, 365 and we will push those updates to you. It's how you, like how you update your phone, your laptop, we'll make those updates av available to you. You simply update them, now update to the latest version. This is something that's unique that no other vendor is providing as of today is that we give a 10 year support. Uh, I challenge you to tell me if there's another vendor who provides that, a 10 year uh, subscription support where if you decide on a particular version, we'll support that for 10 years. Um, for, certain, for 10 years is a significant period of time. Uh, security scanning, like I said, this, all of this stuff comes as part of the updates as well. Um, <coughs> partner coverage, DX has done a tremendous job in getting uh, this, this venue to be fully booked. Uh, but similarly, we have partners all around the world. So all the summits that we are going to run that Steve mentioned, we have 21 summits. Every single summit is being co-sponsored uh, co by a partner. So, so we believe in partners. Uh, you know, we've been able to get into these key markets with very little footprint, our own uh, involvement, and uh, the partner network is growing. So I know that there are some uh, system integrated companies here as well, so we welcome you. If you're interested to be part of this ecosystem, by all means, please do get in touch with us. We have our channel manager, Inthi, raise your hand right over there. You can talk to him and uh, sign up as a partner as well. And you know, the closing notes here, what I want to reemphasize again here is that we are the world's largest open source integration company uh, from a revenue standpoint. So all I'm trying to say here is that if open source in fact is, is, is a element that you want to consider, you should put WS2 on that list of products that you want to check out, right? And hopefully we come on top, we are the best choice at the end of the day, but if that is in case uh, a reason, please do look, uh, check us out. Uh, largest Apache community, again, we are very much uh, entrenched and believe of open source, uh, and we will continue to be an open source uh, advocate. And sixth largest open source vendor overall. I think we are the fifth now, ever since the acquisition of Red Hat. So we just want every other company to get acquired and we'll be number one. Um, <laughs> that's the easy way of getting there. Anyway, so, so that's my quick sp uh, splish uh, of WSO2. Uh, you know, of course, this is just a presentation. We are here for the rest of this. I'm here for the rest of this week. So if you have time, we're more than happy to catch up um, and talk more about WS2 and see how we can help you guys out. Uh, if not, we have account managers on both WS2 and the Arcs. We can sit with you guys and, and talk through uh, anything that you have today. All right, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. <laughs>